Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games from April 1987. I check out the Cheetah Spectrum. I review some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff continues to look at Willy's, again. And I end with a book review. But first, it's the news. Addictive Games, the company ran by Kevin Toms, has signed a deal with Prism Ledger that sees Prism take over not only the back catalogue, but also four future games, including the newly released President. As Addictive is absorbed into Prism, Kevin Toms will now be working under the name of KJT Design Limited. Sheffield-based software house Gremlin Graphics have signed a deal with Canadian development house Acme Animation that will give them the chance to get their titles into the US market. Despite this potentially massive undertaking, Gremlin are still expanding in the UK, opening a third development studio in Derby to go with the ones already set up in Sheffield and Birmingham. The Ministry of Defence is said to be contacting many companies with a view to copyright infringement and its own patented LCD screen technology. The patent is for LCD screens to produce a clear image close to that of conventional CRT tubes and rumours are that several companies, including Sinclair, are using it without permission. Although the patent is in place in the UK, USA and Canada, it has not yet reached Japan, where most of the components are manufactured. How this move will affect Sinclair's new Z80 computer has yet to be defined, because that uses this technology. Maybe a price increase, or maybe even withdrawal. But Clive Sinclair says he has not yet been contacted by the MOD, so cannot comment on the situation. The Z88 itself has been delayed, read into that what you will. Sinclair now say that the unit will begin full production in 6-8 to eight weeks. The company is also coming under fire for advertising the product and taking orders without actually saying when the delivery date will be. Firebird have purchased the rights to most of Activision's back catalogue and will be releasing over 40 titles across the next 12 months. If you missed them first time round, you'll be able to get your hands on such titles as Back to the Future, Eye of the Mask and Pitfall 2. Seiko have released a new watch that you can plug into your Spectrum and upload various bits of data. The Seiko RC1000 will have a diary, events, calendars and a notepad and the data for this can be entered into your computer and then uploaded via a special lead. To use it though, your Spectrum will need Interface 1 because the watch uses RS232 for connectivity. There is now a new improved version of the humble microdrive cartridge created by Ablex. The popularity has not faded since Sinclair sold the rights to Ablex six months ago and they have now added a redesigned internal spring mechanism to improve reliability and performance. And that's the news and now on to the top selling games. Riding high in the charts this month is Bombjack 2 the follow-up to the arcade hit from Elite Systems. Transmuter, the horizontal shooter from Codemasters. Feud, the graphics arcade adventure from Bulldog. Ollie and Lisa, a platformer from Firebird. And Thrust 2, the gravity-defying game, also from Firebird. And that was the news and top-selling games from April 1987. The Cheetah Spectrum was one of those add-ons that sounded cool in more ways than one, but unless you were a budding musician or interested in music, it held little value. I've been trying to get round to reviewing this bit of kit for over a year now, so here we go. Firstly, it costs, when new, an amazing £29.95, which although is a lot for a Spectrum add-on, 
When you compare it to a professional drum machine, which costs over £200, this really was a bargain, considering the Lindrum-like sound effects you get from it. In the box there's the unit itself, which is only slightly bigger than a joystick adapter. Coming out of it is an audio lead to connect to some form of amplification. There is a small but packed manual, and of course the software. The tape comes with a standard set of drum sounds to use, but Cheetah also released further tapes, three in total, the Latin set, the Afro kit, and the Electro kit, and we shall hear these later. Once everything is plugged in and the software is loaded, you get a very complex looking screen. This is a serious piece of kit, bordering on professional, at least back in 1985. The software allows you to store 16 songs, each containing up to 64 different patterns using 8 samples or drum kit sounds. For example, the snare, hand claps, etc. On the left hand side are the 16 slots, waiting to be edited. On the right are various options to select and play, change the tempo and give your masterpiece a name. Choosing the first song, you are prompted for the number of divisions. This sets out how many places there are that can have sound applied. Pressing P will take you into the pattern editor where you can now add the sounds into your song. You can do this by using the cursor keys to move the pointer to the desired slot and select which sound you want to insert from the list below. You also have a choice to do this in real time, which I would stay away from at least until you're more familiar with the software. It takes a bit of time to get used to how the editor works, especially the delete option, after which you then have to reinsert a slot, otherwise the whole length is wrong. It doesn't take time though to get a decent pattern. You can then save this into one of the 64 slots you have, ready to be built into a song. Once you have more than one pattern, you can then start putting your song together. In the song editor, you can use L and Enter to move left and right. You can insert patterns in any order and choose how many times to loop them. Using this method you can build up quite a long song very quickly from all the patterns you've already created and the end result is very impressive. Let's take a look at some of the other drum kits available. The Latin kit gives us, well, Latin drum sounds. The Afro kit gives us a different set of sounds like the conga, the trunk and coconuts. And finally the Electro kit gives us a blast from the 80s with electric snare, toms, and a zap. The Cheetah Spectrum was an exceptional piece of kit for its time, and is still very good, with end results not too far away from the things you used to hear on top of the pops. Throw in a few synth sounds and a sequencer, and it shows that this add-on can mix it with the best. A great add-on then for anyone interested in music, and of course, the Spectrum. This is Gyroscope, released by Melbourne House in 1985. From the cover, you can probably guess what style of game this is. It's a Marble Madness clone. 
you control a gyroscope instead of a marble and try to negotiate down a series of screens to reach the final goal. The screens have slopes of different angles which causes your gyroscope to increase speed. And if you are not careful, usually go flying off the edge. There are also things floating around that you have to avoid. Not to mention the walls that will instantly kill you if you touch them. This last one is a real pain. It means you have to be almost pixel perfect and keep your gyroscope in the middle of the path. And this may sound easy, but your gyroscope has inertia. Moving in one direction causes the gyro to continue. Changing direction is not instant, so you do have to try and plan your route. The controls, because of the inertia, feel slow to respond, but once you get used to them, they reflect the movement of the gyroscope. When you get to the bottom of the screen, the colour flips to magenta before scrolling, which is very off-putting, and can sometimes cause you to lose the path you were aiming for, which usually means death. There's also a time limit too, so you can't hang around. There's also the usual ground-based controls that cause you to veer off or be slowed down. Graphics are, apart from the magenta swap, well drawn and look nice. Sound-wise, and there's some nice music, even on the 48k machine. And the sound is adequate throughout the game, with a few spot effects when you die, or get stuck in some of the traps. I found the game a little tricky. The inertia was sometimes difficult to anticipate, and the collisions with walls makes it really frustrating. And there are some sections where you can only just squeeze past, which I think is a bit unfair. It would have been better to allow you to bounce off walls rather than get killed by them, and just have the pits and drops and evil floating things that kill you. If you like Marble Madness, certainly give this one a try, otherwise I think you may find it a little frustrating. This is Ollie and Lisa 3, The Candlelight Adventure. Released by Cartoon Time, open brackets Codemasters, close brackets, in 1989. Ollie wakes up to find someone has stolen his beloved car and dismantled it. Grabbing a candle, because it's dark and they haven't yet discovered electricity, he heads off around a spooky castle to collect them and put his car back together. It's not that simple though. Before he can find and use the part, he has to first find a magnifying glass and a spanner. So it's a typical arcade adventure game then. The platform layout is far from typical though, with many rooms that can't be navigated by jumping, and you find yourself having to use doors or moving platforms. And the oddities don't end there. These doors, as far as I can tell, take you to different places, sometimes randomly. You can enter one door on one screen, appear on the second screen, re-enter the door and it takes you to a completely different screen. You also have the problem that you can only fall a certain height before dying, and some platforms you can fall through, and you can't even identify them, they look exactly the same as the other platforms, which is a bit annoying. And if all this wasn't enough, your candle continually burns down and you have to keep picking up new ones. There are though other things to help you, like health potions and a telephone, that when used will point you in the direction of the thing you're looking for. And there's more. There's ghosts flying about. Some will harm you, some won't. You can only carry a certain amount of objects, so it's a matter of finding the ones you need and getting down to your cart to put it back together again. There's also a nice puzzle element thrown in, whereby you can manoeuvre a certain platform, left or right, 
and this will allow you to drop down from a higher platform or be used as a springboard to trampoline up to higher levels. The graphics are brilliant, very well drawn and animated with some great background details. There's also some great comedic effects and the whole game just looks fantastic. Sound is used well too and there are some nice effects throughout the entire game. Playability though is where I think it falls down, just like poor old Ollie when he encounters one of those mystic platforms that don't actually hold him. The door navigation is the main problem and also you can't climb down ladders. You would have thought you could just press the down key, but no, you have to just keep walking left and right and slowly descending. Having played the game for over an hour, I never actually managed to find a single part for the car. Maybe I should have tried to map it, but like I've said before, that seemed impossible. Because of this, I felt the game didn't have a logic to it, and it was all randomly thrown together just to throw you off the track. If arcade adventures are your thing, then this is a great looking game that will certainly give you a challenge. If you're a logical person though, stay clear, it will drive you bonkers. This is Deep Core Raider, written by myself using Arcade Games Designer and released in 2016. With so many planets and asteroids holding valuable minerals, large corporations send out not only probes, but entire automated discover and protect units. Any resources found and a series of defence units are set up to make sure that no one can help themselves until a full mining team can be dispatched. These discover and protect units are easy to track though, if you have the right tools, and if you can get there before the large corporations, you can make a fortune. Of course, the stakes are high. You have to navigate through the caverns and defences. The game is a collect em up, featuring controls similar to Lunar Lander. Your craft is constantly pulled downwards, and you have to use your thrusters to move around. You also have to watch your fuel, but there are refills scattered about. You also have bombs that can be used to blow away mines, or any hostile aliens you might encounter. There are five planets to raid, featuring different graphics and different cave layouts, and a special treat at the end if you can make it. The graphics are nice, large and well drawn, and as with all arcade games designer games, move smoothly. Sound is well used and uses the AY chip, so for best results play it on a 1 to 8 machine. If you like the look of it, it's free to download from my blog, and I hope you enjoy it. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at what I'm going to call Jet Set Willy Backwards. And the reason I'm going to call it that is because I can't actually pronounce whatever Jet Set Willy spelled backwards should be. Jet Set Willy Backwards was released in 2004 by Andrew Broad under his Broadsoft label. The reason I chose an Andrew Broad game next was that Andrew Broad really was the original person who started the Jet Set Willy mod scene in my mind. Way back as far as the 90s, Andrew Broad was creating and releasing Jet Set Willy mods and he had his own web page where you could download a lot of them and there was a lot of information for people who wanted to create Jet Set Willy mods on that page. Now, of late, Andrew's stopped doing as many mods, there aren't as many on his website, you can't find as many, but if you go back you can play them and there are some absolutely excellent ones. I'll come to the reason why I chose this one in particular in a while, but he did some great ones. He did the Lord of the Rings Jet Set Willy game, which I nearly chose for this slot, and that is a really, really good game. If anyone wants to 
play a really good Jet Set Willy mode by Andrew Broad, I would highly recommend the Lord of the Rings game. However, I do think that game is a little bit difficult in parts. When I started playing it, I played it and I completed it with save states. And what I thought is Jet Set Willy Backwards is just a bit more accessible, which is why I chose it. Now what happens is, you start playing this game and you think, Oh hold on, I know Jet Set Willy, this is just all the rooms in reverse. So every room has been reversed in this game. So instead of exiting to the left of the bathroom when you first start, you exit to the right. And you think, well I know this game, I can navigate around this, it should be easy. But you find it isn't. Now the gameplay in this isn't identical, there are some differences. I think the way the ropes swing is different. I think they just seem to set off in different directions. Now I have tried comparing it to the original and they do seem to swing differently but they don't swing in an exact reverse mirror to the way that the original rope swing swang, at least not in all of the rooms. The most notable, and the first time I realised this, was when I played it and went into the orangery and dropped down into the swimming pool and found that the rope wasn't there. The next thing is some of the timing of the sprites is different. So on the conservatory roof, what you're normally able to do is collect the object and then walk to the left and drop off onto the platform, then drop below into the orangery. In this game, you can't do the converse of that, which is walk to the right and drop off into the platform. The baddie there kills you, and he doesn't in the original. So everything isn't quite the same. The room I found this most difficult in was We Must Perform a Curtiff League, where the sequencing of the arrows is different, and basically, if you don't jump at just the right point near the start of the room, you'll get an arrow in the back. But all that said, this is a really, really clever idea. I don't know how Andrew Broad had this, and I don't know what it made him think of doing this, but it's just such a clever idea. This is one of those games that you start playing, and you just want to keep playing and see see what's next. Even though it's reversed, you think to yourself, let's just see what's around the corner, let's just see what's next, let's just see what this room looks like backwards and how it feels, and if there are any differences. And it really drew me in. I said I'd say this a lot in the series, and I will. I just started playing this game and kept playing it and kept playing it. I needed to use save states to complete it, which I did. I didn't know if there was some clever ending where something was reversed, and I won't spoil the ending by telling you whether it is or it isn't. I'll just say this. Don't expect too much from the ending in this game. But you will need save states, or you will need to master this game again. It isn't identical in gameplay to Jet Set Willy, which does set it apart, and I think that's what sucked me in. It's something just different enough to be interesting, but is familiar enough so that you are instantly pulled in, and you instantly are familiar with this, so it's not foreign. It's not Some of the mods you start playing, you think, oh my god, what am I supposed to do here? This is completely different. Whereas this, you don't. There are also some other kind of really clever touches. So the music, both the title music and the in-game music, has also been reversed. And I found that gave a different feel to the music. If I was a rich man in reverse, I don't know, it has has a strange feel, almost a melancholy feel to it. So that's Jet Set Willy backwards. And Andrew Broad as well. I think Andrew Broad has to take a lot of credit for kind of kick-starting the Jet Set Willy mod scene. I'm not saying there wouldn't be any Jet Set Willy mods without Andrew, but he played a big part in creating a scene around it. Not just creating one, but creating many, many Jet Set Willy mods. He was quite prolific back around the millennium and created many, many great games. Honestly, go and check them out if you haven't seen them. And his page is still there. You can still find his page. It's it's a bit under construction, and I don't think it's maintained anymore. But there's a lot of information for people wanting to create Jet Set Willy mods still on his page. And in this kind of sequence of games, this is the next one, because this was the next step. Andrew Broad and his sequence of games, his sequence of mods, was the next step in the Jet Set Willy mod scene. So that's Jet Set Willy backwards. Until next time, happy gaming! This is Gold Rush, released by Thorn EMI in 1983. This is somewhat of an original game, 
At least I haven't seen anything like it, or anything that resembles it anywhere. You are in a mine, and gold nuggets are falling from the roof. And you have to collect them in one of your two pots at the bottom of the screen. And to do this, you have to position girders so that the nuggets roll into their target. You only have a limited number of girders though, and these are shown on the left. You also have to avoid the skulls floating about, and the nuggets falling down, otherwise you'll lose a life. The skulls also can remove your girders and place them somewhere else on screen, so you have to continually watch them. The action is constant, and there's a lot to think about here, and a lot to keep you busy. As you progress, another skull will join in, making things even harder. You can remove girders yourself and place them somewhere else by just moving over them and pressing fire, and then moving away and pressing fire again. The graphics are large and well animated, as you can see, and move smoothly. The sound, though, is non-existent. Yes, the game is silent, which is a real shame. The game code is only 5k, that's less than a loading screen, so there's plenty of room for them. An interesting game, and a challenging one, only let down by the lack of sound. In 2013, a Kickstarter project was set up to produce the definitive book covering the iconic software house Ocean. With this project being funded, it wasn't long before the book was compiled and released to fans. Covering the complete history of the company and including content from big names, this large, glossy, colourful book is a really interesting read. Many well-known industry names add their voice to the story too, covering the highs and lows of this now famous Manchester-based software house. There are tales of late night coding sessions, management decisions, larks and tomfoolery, visits from famous people and of course the infamous TV documentary commercial breaks. You get to read about how the graphics were created, how the music was created, as well as insights into the games. The quality of this book, physically, is top notch. Nice and thick glossy paper helps to show off the incredible artwork of the games. Content wise it's really interesting as I've said before and you finally get a peek at what really happened behind closed doors of a famous software house. This book is especially interesting if like me you bought a lot of ocean games and the book covers many computers in many formats not just the Spectrum. There's also sections about the movie tie-ins like Rambo, Robocop and Daily Thompson. So all in all this is a great book which is still available on various websites including eBay and Amazon. If you have an interest in the industry, and if you're watching this show you probably do, then this is a great read and highly recommended.